Western civilization, Western philosophy, and Western theology all say God is timeless because it's built on Aristotle's declaration that God is timeless. What we do know from the Bible is God entered into creation. But some people still wanting to defend timeless will say, well, maybe he entered into creation, but he didn't become temporal. Maybe it's like he dived into a swimming pool but didn't get wet. And I want to tell you, when we look in Scripture now, here's the deciding point. If God has emotions to go up or down, then he's in time. If God can change his mind... He's in time. The proof that God is temporal versus timeless is can he change or not? Now, this was a huge issue in Western civilization. A guy named Augustine, right around the year 400, he's not a Christian, he was raised in the Greco-Roman educational system. After Aristotle comes a guy named Plotinus. Plotinus is the next major thinker, builds on the same two worlds, there's a spiritual world and an actual world, but he adds one major point, that God, who is timeless, radiates out all of his attributes, like the sun radiates light. Augustine was a student of Plotinus before he was a Christian. He studied Plotinus, and he had a concept of God. God is timeless and he radiates out like the sun. Therefore, if God is God, then he radiates holiness, beauty, wrath, love. Everything of God radiates out. Now, deep in the Western consciousness is that concept of God. But if God radiates out and he's timeless, then he can never turn off any of those things because that would be changed. Augustine now starts attending a church. He goes to a church where Bishop Ambrose was preaching. And Augustine, in his own book called Confessions, writes, I could not believe the Bible was true because this God in the Bible changes his mind. You see, he's got Plotinus's concept of God, but he knows that means God can't change. He said, Sunday after Sunday, he listened to Bishop Ambrose and he said, this book can't be true because God changes his mind and has emotions. But one day, and he writes in his book, Confessions, Bishop Ambrose said from the pulpit, the Old Testament examples of God changing his mind and having emotions are not true. They're just anthropomorphisms, which means it was the author putting God in human terms so you and I could understand. You see, Bishop Ambrose had also trained under Plotinus. He was a leading Christian. But one day he taught that every example in the Bible of God changing his mind and having emotions are not true. Those are just figures of speech. Augustine wrote, that day I could believe the Bible. But notice what he's done. He's rejected every example of God changing his mind or having emotions. Augustine is the single most influential theologian in Western Christianity. He is considered by Catholics the father of Catholicism. Both Martin Luther and John Calvin, they consider him the father of their theology. Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. John Calvin writes in his um, Institutes of Christian Religion that he could have formed all of his theology by quoting Augustine instead of the Bible. That's what he said. Augustine's concept of God, God radiates out his attributes. One thing that happens in Western civilization, emotions are squelched. Why? Because if God has no emotional variation, then if you want to be like God, you should have no emotional variation. In the Middle Ages, the cathedrals, you walk in, you look straight ahead. God is massive, unmovable. The cathedral is teaching you who God is, and if he has no emotions, you come in and take on his countenance. You look straight ahead. Western civilization takes on a value that if you are someone tossed to and fro by your emotions, you're not very mature. You're not very godlike. Many cultures are not suppressed like Western people are. It all comes right back here from our concept of God. 
But now if God can't change his mind, the key scripture for Augustine was Exodus 32, verse 10 to 14. If you have your Bible, you can look there. But that's when the Hebrew people are down and they make a molten calf. Moses goes up on the mountain, meets with God, and as they're coming down from the mountain, God says in verse 10 of Exodus 32, he says, step aside, Moses, I'm going to torch them all. I might be paraphrasing that. Now I'm going to kill them all. Okay? But then it goes on and says, Moses interceded and said, wait a minute, God, don't kill them. And he reasons with God and said, what will the Egyptians say? Don't you have a covenant with these people? Don't kill them. And in verse 14 of Exodus 32, it says, God changed his mind about the harm that he said he would do. That verse, Augustine decided is not true. And that was when he said, I now believe the Bible, but notice what he was doing. He rejected every incidence that says God changed his mind. Now, before that time in history, the Hebraic thought was, no, God has emotions. God changes his mind. The Hebrew people, even to this day, like, you ever watch Fiddler on the Roof? Come on, God, can we talk about this? I mean, it's, it's a relational dynamic, and if we're talking about who is the God of the Bible, there are certain things in our culture that you've got to question. Is it really true? It really has not been until this last century that emotions have been expressed in Christianity in the Western world. And in fact, if someone raised in a very traditional church comes into this church on Sunday morning, they walk in the back and they see some of you raising your hands or saying, praise the Lord. What are they going to feel? Yeah, you guys are so irreverent. What's wrong? God doesn't like that. Don't these people know God doesn't like that? Where do they get the idea that God doesn't like it? 1,400 years of Christianity teaching that God doesn't like that. It's only been like in the last couple generations when we have been reconsidering and thinking maybe God likes it. But if you're gonna open this can of worms, you've gotta answer some theological questions. Did God enter into creation in the sense of entering into time? Or is God timeless and therefore he cannot enter into time? Well, we have proof that he can and has. Jesus Christ, the word became flesh. The proof that God can become temporal is Jesus Christ. You can't deny it. Therefore, if you accept the incarnation, you have to reconsider God's nature itself because in Jesus, God became temporal. Every example now in the Bible of God changing his mind or having emotions is evidence, if you accept it as fact as it's written here, that God has stepped into our world. I want to propose to you that our God has stepped into our world. I don't know how he exists outside of creation, but this book reveals to me that he's in time, in creation. Therefore, when God comes down to Abraham and says, I'm going to destroy Sodom, Abraham reasons with God. And says, Abraham, if there's, I've said, God, if there's 50 righteous, you won't destroy him, will you? Oh, God, if there's 15 righteous. Abraham believed that he could have a cooperative relationship and he might be able to change God's mind. Moses reasoned with God, don't kill them, Lord. What will the Egyptians say? In verse 14 of Exodus 32, God changed his mind. I take those as proof that God did enter into creation, and he relates to humanity because he's right here. If he's not in time, then it changes all of our theology. You see, not only do emotions change, but if God radiates out his attributes, he also radiates out his will. And if he's timeless, he can never make new decisions. Because you can't be this way today and a later be this way if you're timeless. There can never be any shift in God saying he wants this and later he wants something different. If God is timeless, then all of his decisions were settled in eternity past and he never has another decision to make. If God is timeless, 
then all things are predestined. And sure enough, Augustine, Luther, and Calvin all believed all things are predestined. The only logical conclusion, if God is timeless and he radiates out his will, is all things are predestined. Next, humans have no free will. If all things are predestined, then man has no free will. Augustine, Luther, and Calvin all agreed man has no free will. Earlier, when Augustine was young, he wrote a book that man does have free will, but after he matured, he grew out of it and believed man doesn't have any free will. Luther wrote a book called Bondage of the Will. The entire book is proving that man has no free will. Calvin was consistent throughout all his writings that humans have no free will. So if you change this aspect of God, does he radiate out his will? There's the implications that fall like dominoes, and the big one is everything's predestined, man has no free will. Now, we'll take one more step, and then let's dialogue. It's all about the cross, Jesus Christ. You see, if God radiates out his attributes, and he's timeless, then he can never turn off anything. It's been on for eternity past, it's on in eternity future. Therefore, I'm gonna draw the word God up here, and we're radiating out now God's wrath. John Calvin, a guy about at this point, is trying to decide then, if God radiates out his wrath, how are humans saved from the wrath of God? And what he decides is Jesus is the wall between us and the wrath of God. Now there's a name for this explanation of why Jesus died. Why Jesus died is called the atonement. The atonement is your explanation for why Jesus died. This is called the penal substitutionary atonement. John Calvin developed this. God radiates out his wrath. You see, if he radiates his wrath, he can never turn it off. Therefore, we need something to block it. And Jesus took on the wrath of God. And for us to be saved, we need to hide behind this in order that we are not gonna receive the wrath of God. So with the penal substitution, God took his wrath out on Jesus. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, God took his wrath out on him, and what killed Jesus was the wrath of the Father. Now, therefore to be saved, I need to be under hiding here. People who are not hiding under there, the wrath of God continues to be on them. But now, Calvin has to ask a question. If God radiates out his wrath, did God take out his wrath for all of humanity or just for these people? You see, if God took out all of his wrath for all of humanity, that means the sins of everybody are taken care of and everybody's saved. If justice was already done and God took all his wrath for all humanity, then he as injustice cannot punish anyone. So John Calvin says that can't be true. Therefore, Jesus must have only died for those who are predestined to be saved. That's called limited atonement. There's no logical way to escape the conclusion that if God is timeless, Jesus only died for some people. If Jesus only died for some people, then those people are predestined to heaven and these people are predestined to hell. Through nothing they've done, but because God, before creation, is eternally settled, who he's going to have Jesus die for, and he who doesn't. If you believe God is timeless, logically you must conclude that Jesus only died for some people. Now, this penal substitutionary atonement leads to what's called double predestination. Double predestination predestination. Meaning doesn't matter if we're going to heaven or hell, everybody's predestined, they have no choice. Besides, you don't have a free will anyway. Now, let's jump up here. I'm proposing to you that God is different than the God below the line. And in fact, what you will come to discover is that the God revealed in the Bible does not act in the same way 
In fact, he can change his mind. Therefore, this God can exercise wrath, but turn it off. <laughs> 